Okay, hi everyone. My name is Sharka and I will be presenting and talking about color in digital painting and about pigment mixing. So let's start with what I mean with pigment mixing. I mean the behavior of pigmented paints that we're all used to from real life. And this goes back to kindergarten. So what you're looking at is not really surprising, I know, but that's why it's important to highlight those pigment effects because otherwise we might take them a little bit for granted. So in real life, blue and yellow make green. And notice how dark this blue pigment is. Uh, it's called phthalo blue, and it produces this beautiful grassy green when mixed with yellow. Now let's have a look what happens to phthalo blue when we mix it with white. It changes hue to, to turquoise and it drastically increases saturation. And this happens to other pigments too. Magenta goes from dark red to pink and phthalo green goes from green to cyan. And the same happens with pigments when we just spread them on canvas. They shift hue and gain saturation. And look at those beautiful gradients. And these are just three examples, but all paints do this to some extent. And we can see these gradients in practically every physical painting because this is the way paints behave. So um, we might expect color in painting software to behave the same way, right? Something like this. Well, they don't. Um, none of the widely used professionally painting software treats colors as pigments. So what happens to color in painting software instead? So generally, and there are some exceptions, but generally they treat color as, as light and mix it additively in RGB. And additive mixing is basically a weighted linear average. And if you make an average of blue and yellow in RGB, you really do get gray. It's correct for emitted light for a, from a computer screen, for example, but that's not how paints behave, as you can see from this slide. So um, using additive mixing in a painting software seems wrong. And now you might think, well, what about subtracted mixing? Isn't that the answer to paint-like color behavior? Well, it's a little bit closer, but it's a still no. Uh, subtractive mixing models the absorption of light passing through colored filters. And this is kind of curious, but the algebraic operation for light absorption is multiplication, not subtraction. We're not subtracting anything here the light spectra are multiplied during absorption. So here's just a quick example. We all know that magenta and cyan make blue in subtractive mixing, right? So this is the spectrum of magenta and this is the spectrum of cyan. And the resulting blue spectrum is their interception. It's a per wavelength multiplication. So subtractive mixing is a completely misleading notification. Anyway, um, physically, this is still incorrect because light absorption is just a part of the pigment mixing process. Paints don't just absorb light, they also scatter it. And that's vitally important because look how wrong this looks. Uh, so the bottom line is that subtractive mixing is not the answer to pigments behavior. And it should also be called multiplicative mixing. So let's move on from this. What happens to light when it passes through a paint blob? And you already know the answer. It gets repeatedly absorbed and scattered. And this is a pretty familiar phenomena for people in graphics because this is subsurface scattering. And if you want to model realistic pigments behavior, you need to simulate subsurface scattering, which in rendering is done with path tracing. So now you may think, well, this kind of explains why no pigment, uh, why no paint painting software implements it, because you don't have time for path tracing in digital painting, except we don't need path tracing. Um, almost a century ago, there was this duo, Pavel Kubelka and Franz Munk, who came up with a closed form solution to all this. The, the result of subsurface scattering is a reflectance spectrum. It's the color of the material in question. And Kubelka and Munk gave us a diffuse reflectance formula predicting just that, 
all you need is two spectra measured directly from the pigment, its absorption and scatter, which is the K and S coefficients in the equation. So when you mix two or more pigments together, you just make a linear combination of their absorption and spectra coefficients, uh, absorption and scatter coefficients, and you pass it through this equation and get the color of the mixture. So that's how easy it is. And look how beautifully Kubota and Munch predicts the behavior of paints. It's almost unbelievably accurate. And the bottleneck here is the correct measurement of the two spectra from the pigment. But luckily, there are some data, data sets available today. So now is a good time to ask, why isn't this perfectly accurate pigment mixing model used in digital painting industry? And we think that the answer might be that it's too impractical to use. Uh, there are some papers proposing ways to use Kubelka and Munch in painting software, but they all require tracking of some pretty complex features per pixel. So for example, Haas and Mayer proposed to track the absorption and scatter spectra sampled. Um, Baxter proposed tracking the pre-selected pigment concentrations. So until now, using Kuvilka and Munch in painting software required to increase substantially the number of per pixel channels. But every painting software operates on three RGB channels plus alpha. And you might think that today, increasing the number of per pixel channels should not be that big of a problem, but still nobody seems to be willing to do it. So it probably is. And on top of that, using real pigments gives you a reduced color gamut. It doesn't cover all the RGB colors, which means that the artists would lose their RGB picker and they also wouldn't be able to load and work with photographs. Photographs. So um, these are the limitations that kept the, de the developers from implementing pigment mixing into painting software. And we knew that if we wanted to change that, we would have to come up with a model that uses Kubel Kamu for color mixing, but it operates purely on RGB and covers the whole RGB gamut. And that's what we did. We created this black box that takes two RGB colors, arbitrary RGB colors, and represents each of them as a mixture of four selected primary pigments. And then it uses Kubel Kamung to mix them together and it outputs the final RGB. We call this mix box and it's really easy to plug into any existing painting software because it's literally just a drop in for the current mixing function. They have the same, the same um, attributes. So now about some issues that we faced. This is the gamut from the primary pigments that we chose. So these are actually the RGB colors that can be reproduced with those pigments. But obviously there are some RGB colors that cannot be mixed with real pigments. And another issue, there are pigment mixtures that can be represented in RGB because they're outside of the gamut. Um, so that was a problem. But I don't want to get into details how we solve this because it's not really important now. I wanted to focus on this huge gap and why there were papers about pigment mixing in computer graphics lying on the table for three decades and none of the painting software had it implemented. And our guess was that it was too impractical. So we came up with this RGB in RGB out pigment mixing model that hides all the physics by Kubel Kamung inside, and it acts as a black box, which makes it accessible to, to developers. So now we'll see what happens. Uh, but it's already in Verbal, which is a leading software in simulating traditional media. So the natural color mixing was a perfect fit, and I'll show you some, uh, some results now. So this is Verbal, and I prepared a reference image with a color swatch. So I'll be using these colors that you can see. And I also have two layers here, one with the pigment feature off and the other one with the pigment feature on. And I'll start with pigments off. So now I'm just painting with uh, the classical additive mixing. And you can see that the simulation of watercolors and oil is beautiful, but the colors coming from it 
are really muddy and dull, pretty desaturated. And also the brushstrokes that you're seeing now are pretty boring, they're really dull, just lifeless. So now we'll do the same with the pigments on. And I'm using the same brushes and the same starting colors. And you can already see that this looks much more realistic, right? The watercolors actually look like real watercolors. And the oils too, and with all the secondary colors popping up, it just, it just feels more right. Now, look at these brush strokes that I'm painting right now. I'm using the same color as on the left side, but the turquoise and pink and slightly purple color are peeking through the thin layers of the brush stroke, and it makes a huge difference on how we perceive the color of the brush stroke. So uh, you wouldn't be able to actually achieve this with additive mixing. So with pigment mixing, you get juicier brush strokes for free. Uh, and the whole painting process is just more intuitive and creative. And that's not, that doesn't apply just to traditionally trained artists. I think that digital artists would also appreciate having this, you know, lively color behavior as an option because they wouldn't have to worry about their painting getting desaturated like this thing on the left um, with using semi-transparent brushes and after repetitive blending. So I think this is kind of a win situation for all the artists. So, and that's it. Uh, this is the end. I just wanted to tell you that if you want to try it out, we have a live demo uh, on our website and it runs in the browser. So you don't, you don't have to download anything. You can just go ahead and paint and try it out and feel the difference on your own. So if you want, go and try it and let us know what you think. And I thank you very much for your attention.